It's a pleasure to be standing here at the uh, Skagen New Year's conference in front of so many clients and, uh, and friends of Skagen um, in person again. Um, I also, I think, uh, when I see some of the speakers that have come before me, I, I really wish I'd met some of, them, uh, some of them before, given everything that's happened over the last 12 months. Mm. But um, the author George Orwell said that every um, generation imagines itself to be more intelligent than the one that went before it and wiser than the one that comes after it. Now, I want to take the next 15 to 20 minutes to add a pr practitioner's perspective um, to today's theme, which is finding value in uncertainty. And perhaps I'm able to convince you that the intergenerational wisdom, or lack thereof, is constant, at least in the investment world, and is something that we can exploit. Now, I actually think that the topic of today is a little misleading, because if you have a whole conference dedicated to finding value in uncertainty, you're kind of suggesting that it's pretty difficult to do. Um, and I would actually argue that the best place to find good value is actually in uncertainty. And actually, it's possible within uncertainty to not only get higher returns, but also lower uh, risks for long-term investors. Now, the reason why most people find it difficult to embrace and capitalize on uncertainty is because of the stories that we tell ourselves to make sense of the world around us. And this kind of investment narrative, normally through simplified um, investment themes or anecdotes or catchy abbreviations, is actually the recipe for disappointing outcomes uh, for investors. So I'm sure you can imagine how I felt when I was asked to talk about the untapped potential for, of emerging markets. As investment themes go, um, this is probably one of the oldest ones and one with you know, significant intuitive appeal for most long-term investors. Emerging markets, they enjoy faster economic growth as driven by really powerful secular forces such as urbanization, um, rising income levels, um, and driving significant consumption upgrades. Um, add to that, these countries also enjoy some of the most significant endowments of natural resources um, that have yet to be exploited, so the potential is enormous. Now, our Chief Investment Officer, Alexandra Morris, um, gave a detailed presentation about emerging markets at this conference four years ago. Um, she said, um, you know, the economic center of gravity in the world will inevitably go from west to east. And we also claimed at the time that, you know, some of the technology innovation that was happening there would see you be able to order goods from China you know, through Alibaba and have it delivered to your door here in, in Norway. Um, and that this kind of rapid development in emerging markets would see a Chinese technology company such as Alibaba probably become one of the most valuable companies in the world within five years. And I, for those of you who might have seen it, two years ago I gave a digital presentation saying pretty much the same thing. Higher economic growth and underpenetrated financial markets would give a powerful platform for continued investment gains in emerging markets. Now, in a sense, we were both right. You know, these things have happened, and we articulated what were the investment themes that people wanted to hear at that time. Um, you can now order from Alibaba and have your stuff delivered to your doorstep here in Norway. Emerging economies are a bigger share of the global economy than they were two and four years ago. And at over a 1,000, more than double what's been done in the U.S., there have been more IPOs in China than you know, any other country in the world over the last two years. The problem is that these amazing but largely predictable developments have not translated into attractive returns for investors. Over the four years since our first prediction, you know, the U.S. dollar-based emerging markets index has yielded 10% returns. All of it's just been dividends. That's 40 percentage points less than you could get from developed markets. So how do we get the themes right and get such poor returns in, um, in return? Well, the problem is the story or the investment narrative has changed. Things that we hadn't anticipated did happen. You know, as Jonathan Cheng talked about, the relationship between the US and China has developed into a full-on trade and tech war. Uh, COVID has put strains on many emerging economies, and depending on how they've chosen or been able to deal with it, um, uh, they've, they've not come out of it. 
And as Jonathan also talked about, you know, the former high-flying tech sector in, in China that we, we also alluded to has suffered significant regulatory crackdown and calls for national service by, by Xi Jinping. And of course, closer to home, Russia's unprovoked invasion of the Ukraine has put geopolitical risks firmly back on the agenda. And we've had severe economic sanctions and also an energy market uh, put into disarray. So what this means is that the investment narrative in emerging markets has shifted from what could go right to what's already gone wrong, and more importantly, what can go wrong further. So has reality changed as much as the investment narrative? The US has always had an uneasy relationship with China. And surely, as investors, you ascribe a higher political risk to downright you know, socialist countries than you do in Western democracies. And even 20 years ago, we were speculating that China's cover-up of the SARS epidemic you know, would undermine the West's relationship to the country and its leadership. What we can observe, however, is that the perceived uncertainty has certainly increased and market prices have fallen. The question is, does it represent value? Now, Skagen Kontiki practices value investing. We don't do it in the formulaic sense by just looking at low multiples of, of earnings or assets. That's just the value factor. You can get a computer to do it. Instead, what we're trying to do is seek out situations where the intrinsic, or what we deem to be the fair value, um, is significantly lower, or sorry, significantly higher than the prices we observe in the market. Um, now, the difference between the two is, is what we deem the margin of safety, and what we believe is the, the key to long-term returns. Now, I get no points for originality at this point, I, I realize. But, you know, I said I'm a, I'm a practitioner. So I'll leave originality to the academic researchers uh, or those people who think that this time is different. Um, in practice, our investment strategy rests on three interconnected pillars. You know, the firstly, you know, value investing is by its very nature contrarian. There's no guarantee that out of favor or unpopular stocks may be undervalued but the popular ones almost never are. Now, what the crowd is buying today is by definition in favor. And stocks already in favor have been bid up in price based on optimistic expectations, and therefore they are unlikely to represent overlooked or, or, or good value. So this naturally leads us into situations where prices have already fallen, usually because the narrative is negative. Now, to assess the margin of safety, the first thing we have to understand is why has a stock fallen and what's implied by the current price. Then we can compare that to what the future value could be under different conditions. Now, here we use scenario analysis because we don't know what the future will be. We didn't know it two years ago. We didn't know it four years ago. But what we do know is that closing the gap between the low price today and a higher price in the future requires both time and a reason for the narrative to change. And that's what changes the crowd's perception. Now, the way we do it is that we let the numbers guide us uh, and we seek to be patient for the fundamentals to reassert themselves. Now, I'm actually an engineer by background or by education, so the concept of margin of safety isn't completely alien to me. Um, like investors planning a portfolio, Engineers have to consider a range of use cases or scenarios in the design phase. Um, now, in the physical world, such as here, it's pretty easy to know when you've underestimated what can happen or you simply got your numbers wrong. Like the bridge here, you know, things break down. Now, engineers are also practitioners. We have no original theories of our own. We rely on other people's theories to solve these real-life problems. Now, the most useful theories that we use are those that are intuitive and demonstrable, like Hooke's law. Um, it says that the potential energy or the force that pulls a spring increases the further away from the equilibrium position it's moved. Now, most people accept that this is true. And if they don't, we can just have a simple experiment to, to prove it. Um, but I think, importantly, a spring doesn't necessarily spend a lot of time at its equilibrium position. It's merely drawn towards it in the absence of other forces. Now, investors also have a lot of fundamental theories when it comes to valuation. 
Now, Professor Demodoran is, is coming on later on, so suffice to say, I think I'm skating on pretty thin ice here to, to tell you about them. Um, but again, I think most people agree that theoretical value of a security is determined through some form of combination of profitability or cash flow and a discount rate. Now, one of these models is the Gordon Growth model. It's not exactly a new model, as you can see from, from the picture. And it gives the justified price-to-book value given a sustainable return on equity and a sustainable growth rate. Again, the implications are pretty intuitive and demonstrable. Companies with sustainably higher returns on equity trade at higher valuations than those that have lower returns. Um, but like all models, the Gordon Growth model has limitations. The biggest one is that it doesn't explain why share prices move around as much as they do. So here I want to use you know, a market everyone's familiar with, the S&P 500. It's a cross-section of corporate America. It's the world's most developed, most researched, closely followed, and therefore surely the world's most efficient stock market. Now, over the last 30 years, you've had anything from a minus 1% annualized return to a positive 19% annualized return for a decade. Now, over that 10 years, the difference is almost 500 percentage points. And I would argue that 10 years is, even for this crowd, deemed to be long term. Now, to better understand what drives these things, break those returns into the kind of Gordon growth model-like components and see what's happened. Well, the first thing we do is we look at the annual increase in the book value of the index. It's gone up by 6%. We add on then what's been paid out in dividends been 2% per year. Same across all of those three equivalent time periods. And those two put together should be at least given as an approximation of what the returns have been uh, in those periods. And over a 10-year period, you would probably argue, seeing it's been the same, that's, that's a sustainable return. So what we have for a stable return on equity, a stable payout ratio, our model would suggest that prices should stay the same but they haven't. As practitioners, rather than fundamentalists, what we've seen is that the S&P 500 has every year gone up 10% in price on top of the fundamentals, or gone down as much as 8% annually in price. Now, that's despite our theoretical models telling us it should have been constant. And that's what I think, as a practitioner, is what we can try and exploit. And here you look at the, the same metric over time. So again, most efficient, most widely followed market has been priced at anywhere between 1.6 times and 5.1 times the value of its equity over this 30-year period. Now, that's despite the fundamentals staying relatively stable, growing 8%, two of it paid out in the period between these extreme readings. They are the exact same time point. Now, the Gordon model framework only appears to say that something else has changed. And that's what investors have been willing to pay for those fundamentals. So if you turn things on their head, what investors have earned from investing in the index has been the inverse of how much they've been willing to pay for, those, for that privilege. Now, a sufficiently low starting point gives you very good returns, and a sufficiently high starting point gives you very poor returns. Now, again, I'm a practitioner, and I look at the chart and I say, that doesn't look like a random walk. Instead, the in index valuation seems to follow a pattern much like the spring in Hooke's law. It's oscillating between one extreme and the other um, and is nowhere near what you would describe as it, uh, its equilibrium position for long periods of time. Now, if this is the case in the world's largest and most efficient equity market, again, as a practitioner, I would argue that, you know, I would challenge the efficient markets. Um, now, Given we're a conference hosted by an active value manager, I'm hoping there aren't too many efficient market uh, fundamentalists in the room. Um, but what they argue is that there has to be a positive correlation between risk and return, a positive correlation. Now, any disparity between risk and return has to be immediately corrected. That's what makes the market efficient. In inefficient markets, on the other hand, it should be possible to find investments offering both high returns and low risk. Now, normally people argue this happens because there's information asymmetry 
or the analysis is too difficult for most people to do. Only certain people can do it. However, in my experience, this dislocation comes mainly when investors buy or sell investments for reasons other than value. It's when they get caught up in the investment narrative at the time instead of focusing on the numbers. Now, what's this got to do with emerging markets? Well, by definition, emerging markets are less developed. They're likely less efficient than developed markets, such as the US, which I used as an example. Um, and also, for most investors, emerging economies are not their home markets. They often come with political systems or cultural norms that are very different from what we're used to. And if you add in some skepticism to official economic data or lower quality of reported uh, financial reporting, you actually have a setup that is unusually prone to changes in investment uh, narrative. Now, there's a picture from the inaugural BRIC summit in Yekaterinburg in Russia in 2009. Uh, BRIC was a term uh, coined by Goldman Sachs economist uh, Jim Neal in 2001, when he argued that the growth of Brazil, Russia, India, and China would be so great that they would take an ever larger share of the global economy. He was right. You know, the demographic forces made it happen. China's entry into the WTO set off a ferocious growth spurt for these countries. And here you see what happened in terms of valuation. You know, as the investment narrative gathered steam, you know, the valuation started going up. Now, this is happening at the same time that we in the Western world are um, struggling with the great financial crisis in 2008-9, as you can see. So at this point in time, the BRICS, or the emerging markets, offered by far the most compelling investment opportunity at the time, so people were willing to pay for it. And just to tell you how far things got stretched, at this point in time, four of the ten most valuable companies in the world are from emerging markets, and another three of them are the ones supplying the commodities they need to grow. So in hindsight, it's a classic bubble. There was no decoupling from the rest of the world. It's just a narrative used to justify ever higher valuations. So EM equities, which had started at a 70% discount to, to the US market when Jim O'Neill uh, talked about BRICS as a concept, actually ended up trading at a premium. Uh, the blue line here shows the relative price-to-book valuation of emerging markets relative to the US, and the green line shows the total return index. So the higher the line, the better and more expensive emerging markets have been and have become. So what started as a contrarian idea after the financial Asian crisis in 97-98, again, when valuations were a third of what they were in the US, was taken to its consensual extreme as investors sought refuge from what was de deemed to be an uninvestable U.S. market under the great financial uh, crisis. And we seem to have gone full circle again with the EM index now at a 60% discount to the U.S. market, which is actually close to its all-time high valuation on price to book. Now, this shows how the investment narrative has changed at the turning points of the last 25 years. So again, 97-98, we have the Asian financial crisis. Currencies are collapsing under a mountain of debt, and they need bailing out from the IMF, whereas Silicon Valley is showing us what will happen in the future. Ten years later, it's not the Asian economies that need bailing out. They're busy building infrastructure in China. It's the US financial system that needs bailing out. And ten years later, or just over ten years later, History seems to not repeat, uh, but it certainly rhymes. And again, we have all conquering tech companies justifying the valuation of markets uh, in the US. But are we starting to see cracks? You know, lower economic growth, higher inflation. Can these technology companies grow regardless of the macro? Have they decoupled from the real world? Well, time will tell. We don't know what comes next. The future is always uncertain. However, what the market has shown time and time again, it's the perception of the future, the investment narrative, not the actual future that determines the price you pay today. So, as value investors and stock pickers, we're always looking for bargains. Bargains are investments that give both attractive upside potential and a sufficient margin of safety on the downside. There are loads of ways to go about it. We've shown you one way to do it, but I can't help but think that Charlie Munger's advice for fishermen to fish where the fish are is also pretty apt for investing. 
if you really want to uncover bargains, you have to look where the prices have already fallen, where the current investment narrative and valuations can change for the better. Now, right now, emerging markets offer both in abundance. It's this uncertainty that we have today, rather than any secular growth story we used to justify when things are going well, that truly represents the untapped potential of emerging markets. And the only catch is, for everyone here, is that you have to dare to be contrarian to go fishing there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Frederick. Can you just uh, hang on here for a, a minute, uh, Frederick? Because we're getting some good questions for you, and we have a few minutes. So picking up on what Jonathan Cheng said was about China and mobilization. I know you have worked a lot on China. And uh, one of our uh, viewers asks, is there a risk that Chinese authorities will impose capital restrictions on foreign investments? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, there's always a risk. It's within their political power to do mm -hmm. so. Um, ju just also, I think m most people have to understand that China doesn't have a free capital account. Um, as you mentioned, I've worked with China before. I was based in Shanghai working for the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. We had a quota that we were investing on behalf of, of the Norwegian people. Um, and that was one that you, know, you had to apply to put it in, and you also had to apply to get the money out again. So it's, it's very well within possibility that that process is either slowed down or stopped entirely. So there is a risk. How big would you say the risk is? Um, well... I think we always have to assess risk versus, versus the probability of occurrence and what the impact of, of, of that event occurring would be. And I think time and time again, that's why we say to our clients, that's why we have a portfolio and we should be part of your portfolio. So any risk that you take, the asset test for us is that it is not too big so that it derails your entire investment portfolio or what you're investing for. Mm -hmm. And just to lead on to that, you know, Russia is a good example of that. You know, Tim mentioned that we had exposure to Russia at the start of the year. It suffered a significant drawdown. But luckily, because it was part of a diversified portfolio and we had other things that benefited from the aftermath of the, the, the invasion, the energy market, we were able to limit the impact on our unit holders. Mm -hmm. And the influence of China on its neighbors and on emerging markets, how would you describe that very briefly? Well, I, I think China's role in the world keeps growing, right? And their sphere of influence and their sphere of interest will, will continue to grow as the, the country develops. I mean, we've been investing alongside Chinese investors in, in countries in Africa, projects to do with uh, natural resources, etc. It's very natural that they look after their interests. And, and we have to invest in the world that we are a part of. Uh, we you know, we are a small part of it. We can't necessarily change it at Skagen Kontiki. Mm. Very best tip for 2023. Oh, we're all, I'm not allowed to give investment <laughs> advice, I think, but we always say think long term and be diversified. <laughs> so I'll stick to that. Thank you so much. Thank Frederick Bialan. <laughs>